Hello everyone, this is Dr. Seher from DentaVest, your best online mentor for the preparation of INBDA DET and AFK exam. Today, in this video, I'm going to discuss a topic of pediatrics on periodontal diseases in the children. In this video, we are going to discuss, first of all, the anatomical differences between a child periodontium and an adult period. Then we will see different gingival and periodontal conditions that can be seen in children, the etiology, incidence, management along with signs, symptoms, clinical and radiographic features. Now you can see that even for the free or the between the free gingiva and the attached gingiva we have the marginal groove. Try to understand the basic differences here. Gingival color in children is more reddish, coral pink in adults. The contour, the free gingival margin is more rounded while in adults it is more knife edge. For the consistency flabby due to less connective tissue density here and the lack of organized collagen fibers while in adults we know the consistency is more firm and resilient then we have the stippling which can be absent in the primary dentition and you can see starting by the age of 16 the surface structure stippling also appear but in adults stipplings are present in 40 percent of the population you can see the picture here between the primary or the child period and the adult period. Further, if you see the interdental area in children, it is a sagal shaped gingiva. When well, adults, you have a papillary gingiva. The newly erupted teeth, the sulcus depth is greater than the deciduous pedicels here. While in adults, the gingival sulcus depth is 1 to 2 millimeter. Attached gingiva width will increase with the age and concomitant decrease in the sulcus depth, but attached gingiva width is definitely greater in the adults. Now, let us see different periodontal conditions that we have in children, conditions where there is no loss of attachment that is limited only to the gingiva like your acute gingivitis, herpetic or necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, chronic gingivitis that can be induced by plaque or puberty hormonal gingivitis, gingival enlargement like induced by the drugs, traumatic gingivitis. Now the periodontal conditions where there is a loss of attachment like chronic periodontitis induced by a plaque or as a complication of the ortho treatment, aggressive periodontitis or periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic disease like in case of papillon Lefebvre syndrome, Allardalna syndrome, hypophosphatasia, Shidiac Higashi syndrome, neutropenia and Langerhansel. Now first of all let us see what is primary herpetic gingivostomatitis. We know this condition is seen in younger children under age 5 and it is caused by HSV1, herpes simplex virus 1. Lesions are viral vesicular lesions and in this condition, you can see one or two ulcers inside the mouth. The primary condition may not be that symptomatic. It could be just like a mild fever for the child unnoticed by the parents. However, if the same condition happens in older children above age 5 or in younger adults, it turns into an acute condition. That's when the symptoms are very severe, painful ulcers, the mouth is very sore, patient uh, is not able to eat or drink anything, leading to dehydration. So the symptomatic treatment and give the patient fluids, rest, soft diet is very, very important. Also, it may require the use of acycloid ointments in the acute herpetic condition. The primary condition, which is more subclinical flu-like symptoms, you can see uh, one or two ulcers inside patient's mouth, maybe on the gingiva or it can even be seen on the lower lobe. Mucosa, you will see more herpetic lesions on the attached gingiva, heart palate, like on keratinized mucosa, it is more common. Now we see the ANAC condition, necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, it's a very common condition, more common in young males. And the predisposing factor can be bad hygiene, stress, malnutrition, or young males doing the smoking. The ulcers are yellow gray, and it is mainly the fusospirochete infection that is involving Triponema denticola and Privetola intermedia. Predisposing factors as I already mentioned. The treatment is very good oral hygiene is required. Remove any predisposing factor and doing the mechanical debridement of all the necrotic tissues. So if you can see the condition here and you can see all the necrotic tissue is being deposited. Metronidazole may be required for the antibiotic treatment here. Now the chronic gingivitis can be associated with plaque and chronic condition lymphocytes are going to dominate. And onset of puberty, it can start with a gingivitis because of hormonal changes. The next we can have is drug-induced gingival enlargement, where you have more collagen accumulation. This gingival enlargement may even require the surgical treatment, can be superimposed with gingivitis. 
For example, you can see the gingival enlargement in a child 12 year old and that is induced by phenytoin. Now the traumatic gingivitis could be due to some uh, habitual or psychological injuries, minor, major. Mucogingival problems in children can be related to local trauma, post-orthodontic, gingival recession, narrow catenite gingiva. For the screening of payo disease in children, we use BPE, that is basic periodontal examination, which is using some coding system for each extent of the dentition after probing the gingiva and perio pocket with a ball-ended WHO probe. So this BP examination where zero code is healthy gingiva with no pocket of bleeding, one is bleeding after probing but no calculus present, two is calculus and other plaque retentive factors are seen like overhanging, deficient restoration margin, bleeding after probing may also be present, shallow pocket with a band only partly visible, the black band on the probe is partly visible, deep pocket and the band is completely disappeared because you are going deeper into the subgingiva. The risk factor for the periodontal condition, the local risk factor is malocclusion in children, traumatic dental injury, plaque retentive factor like orthodontic appliances, ectopic eruption and the general risk factor can be genetic, inherited like papillon leftover syndrome, the periodontal manifestations arising from these systemic conditions. Ortho treatment can lead to gingivitis, enlargement, root resorption, gingival trauma if the child is not maintaining good oral hygiene. You can see here some of the gingival appliance on the palatal aspect of retracted maxillary incisor. This is the appliance here, especially when the appliances are fixed appliance, it's become difficult to clean under them. Now, when we talk about the aggressive conditions, aggressive conditions are very important, where they are called as aggressive because there's very rapid bone destruction here. So, there are two conditions, LAP and GAP, that is localized aggressive periodontitis and the generalized aggressive periodontitis. You can see, this is AA, that is actinobacillus actinomycetum concomitans as the main bacteria that is involved here. Other bacteria are porphyromonas, fusobacterium and echinella. The localized condition or localized aggressive periodontitis is called as localized because it is mainly limited to your permanent first molars and the incisors. Here, when you see the child uh, with LAP, you will be firstly very shocked that why this guy has so much of bone loss. I don't see that much of plaque or calculus because problem here is not the plaque. Problem is genetic in this child. Genetically, they have problem. They have some dysfunction with the neutrophil chemotaxis. And key, neutrophils being your soldier, they are not able to remove the uh, bacteria properly when they are defective and that will lead to more injury, bone loss with the inflammation. Now the generalized aggressive periodontitis here, we are seeing uh, plaque, gross deposits and here you will see generalized bone loss throughout the dentition. The gingiva appear red, swollen, hemorrhage, extensive area of recession are seen and the bone loss is going to be very rapid and child can lose all the teeth by four years of age. The treatment, of course, oral hygiene instruction is number one, root surface instrumentation, bacterial culturing so that you can give the right antibiotic to the child like metronidazole or amoxicillin. Generalized aggressive, it poorly respond to the treatment. In severe case of generalized periodontitis, you may need to uh, do the extraction of all the primary teeth so that the disease is not progressing anymore. In the permanent dentition, the aggressive periodontitis will involve severe periodontal destruction usually with the onset of puberty. As we know, it can be localized or generalized with the neutrophil chemotaxis defect. The LAP is characterized by localized loss of attachment around permanent incisor and first molar and incidence is only 1%. So clinical feature is formation of pocket, loss of attachment with a permanent incisor and first molar and radiographically, the pattern of bone loss is very distinctive. Bilateral angular or vertical bone loss are identified on the mesial and distal surface of the molar. The gingiva can appear healthy, the level of plaque can look very low, but still a marginal gingivitis can be still present. The clinical appearance of a 13 year old girl with a localized aggressive periodontitis, it looks healthy, but there is so much of bone loss because as I told you problem is genetic here rather than having a bad hygiene. The very severe bone loss you can see along the molars, vertical angular bone loss. And the GAP or generalized aggressive periodontitis, again, these are both a juvenile periodontitis. They are more common in young, adolescent and teenager. In generalized one, you have generalized interproximal attachment loss affecting at least three permanent teeth other than incisors and the first molar. 
and in generalized bone loss of GAP, the patination of both the angular or vertical and horizontal bone loss, which creates an irregular alveolar crest. The more generalized nature of the disease predisposed to multiple and recurrent abscesses that can be formed here. And of course, there will be definitely sign of tooth migration or drifting of incisors with unexpected loosening of the teeth. So you can see clearly in the x-rays how bad is the bone loss here, both generalized as well as the vertical or the angular bone loss can be seen here. The treatment is good plaque control, mechanical debridement and using systemic antimicrobial like tetracycline therapy. 250 milligram four times daily for two weeks or combination of metro and amoxicillin three times daily for one week or periodontal surgery. As a manifestation of systemic disease, the conditions which can lead to periodontitis. Let us see the first condition here, papillon-lefebvre syndrome. This condition is also known as palmoplantar keratoidroma with the periodontosis and it is a genetic disorder, autosomal recessive disorder where there is a mutation of the gene that produces the enzyme cathepsin C. Now clinical features. Children are born looking completely normal, but they may show redness on the palms of hands and soles of feet. Teeth erupt in the normal sequence, but at age 1, when the primary teeth start to erupt, the gum tissue becomes severely inflamed and generalized aggressive periodontitis can be seen. By the age 4, the child can lose all of his primary teeth. Eruption of permanent dentition, it begins in the normal age and in normal sequence, but patient will finally lose all the permanent teeth and become completely edentulous by the age of 14 to 17. You can see the picture here and already the child has lost many of his teeth. And neutropenias, they are heterogeneous group of blood disorders where you have decreased levels of neutrophil. Again, genetic condition as autosomal dominant since you have less neutrophils, you will have more chance of bacterial viral infections characterized by frequent and multiple pyogenic infections of skin and mucous membrane. Gingiva is inflamed, edematous here. Recession, ulceration, and desquamation can also be seen in the gingiva. The treatment is to remove the plaque and calculus and strict plaque control with the antibacterial mouthrins like chlorhexidine. Now, Shidiakigashi syndrome, again, a genetic disorder, autosomal recessive with partial albinism, photophobia, nystagmus, recurrent pyogenic infections, malignant lymphoma, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, severe gingival inflammation, and premature exfoliation of the teeth. The next we have is LAD that is leukocyte adhesion deficiency. It's an autosomal recessive disorder with severe recurrent bacterial infections, impaired wood healing and the patient usually has formation of pus and aggressive gingivitis. Now important condition Ehler-Danlos syndrome. It's an autosomal dominant disorder where you see excessive joint mobility and hyperextensibility of the skin. These patients, they are more susceptible to scarring, bruising of the skin and mucous membranes with fragile gingival tissue advanced periodontal conditions and abnormality is seen on the dentino enamel junction. Along with that, you can see fibrous degeneration of the pulp and the disorganized cementum with the vascular inclusions in the dentine. Now, the Langerhansel histiocytosis, they are non-malignant granulomatous condition and they can affect the pituitary gland, marginal gingivitis, bleeding gingiva, abscess formation, pain along with drifting and mobility of the teeth. One very important radiographic feature here is floating in air appearance for the teeth radiographically because of so severe bone loss around the teeth it looks like teeth are floating in air you can see the picture here of the child with Langerhansel histiocytosis and you can see that severe bone loss it looks like the teeth is floating in air appearance hypophosphatase is a deficiency of alkaline phosphatase enzyme here and it can appear before two years of age with dental features is resorption of the bone premature exfoliation of the anterior primary teeth, hypoplasia or complete absence of cementum with small teeth and a very important feature you see on radiograph is a large pulp chambers in hypophosphatasia along with aplastic or hypoplastic cementum. The diagnosis of hypophosphatasia is mainly confirmed biochemically by the low activity of the serum alkaline phosphatase and a raised level of phosphoethylamine in a 24-hour urine sample. If you can see the picture here and the severe bone loss surrounding. 